O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Welcome to our online worship service this Sunday. It's so good to be with you all. Uh, uh, from what I heard, I wasn't able to make it. Chair yoga was a success. So those are every Wednesday at 7 for the next few weeks at least. Come out, um, do some simple exercise and meet up and, and have some fun over there. Our Google Meet's going to continue uh, looking at resurrection accounts. That's Sunday evenings. It's online. You log on. It's very easy. We always have a good time Sundays at 630 and uh, coming up May 22nd, if you would like to or are able to come out in person, we're going to have a covered dish uh, potluck meal after church that Sunday. Just a t chance to celebrate together, to have some fellowship. So uh, keep all that in mind, but most of all, um, let's just praise God this, this beautiful, beautiful Resurrection Day. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, you give us the joy of celebrating our Lord's resurrection. Give us also the joys of life in your service and bring us at last to the full joy of life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson continues on in the Gospel of John, uh, sort of the continued appearances of Christ. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there, there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. 
After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. That's, that's John 21, verses 1 through 19. I think that uh, every diner in the South should have this passage quoted. John 21, 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Can't you just see just signs in that kind of live, laugh, love font in the diner? Jesus said, come and have breakfast. I love to have breakfast. It is not just my favorite meal of the day. Uh, I probably could and sometimes would just eat breakfast food. If you were going to pick a meal for me to eat, a, a classic old school breakfast with some eggs, uh, pancakes, hash brown, you know, I mean the, the all-star Waffle House, right? I could probably eat that every meal of every day. I love it. Uh, I eat a good amount of eggs, as some of you know, and I uh, could probably scramble an egg every day with every meal. And I love waffles and pancakes and French toast, and most of all, I love maple syrup, right? And the breakfast meats, right? You got your bacon, your sausage, ham. I love breakfast. Breakfast is the, uh, the only meal where you're not expected to eat vegetables, right? <laughs> you just get the good stuff. You know, maybe some fruit, maybe. And I have so many fond memories of, of breakfasts I've had. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you go visit somewhere, you'll have breakfast with someone. Or uh, I love that now the tradition for a lot of weddings is the day after the wedding, they have brunch, right? Everyone gets together before they leave and have brunch. And I have such wonderful memories of, of growing up and being at grandma's or at home and just uh, on the weekend, you know, getting sort of the full breakfast and being able to take your time to eat. Y'all in the South have these great things called grits. They're great. It's just a good meal. I think, I was trying to think about why it is I love, I love it so much. And there's, there's nostalgia and history and there's maple syrup. I think there's also something about that meal that is so hearty. Sometimes if you eat too much, it's too hearty. But, <coughs> excuse me. But to me, that sort of classic American breakfast, it's a farmer's breakfast, right? For those of us who go and uh, sit at a computer for a couple hours a day, we don't really need it. But for people who are going out to the fields to work, you need a lot of carbs and some protein and some, some, some breakfast like that <clears throat> to keep you going. It is a sort of sustenance to sort of fill your stomach for a hard day of work. <clears throat> and the other thing I, I love about uh, breakfast, and we're going to get to Jesus in a minute, I promise. Breakfast is the meal with the most possibility. You know, especially if you're eating sort of that full breakfast and taking your time, usually it's a weekend. You got the whole day ahead of you. Anything could happen. You could go anywhere. There's all sorts of possibilities. Breakfast is sort of the potential energy of meals. Think of all the things I could do with this energy, these calories I'm consuming. It's full of possibility. And so it is an amazing thing that one of the last things, just about the last thing Jesus does in John's gospel is invite the disciples to breakfast. They've had a dinner, which we call the Last Supper. But in truth, they have another meal, a breakfast. To me, the fact that the gospel ends with them sort of sitting around the beach, having this morning meal, it is a sign to us 
that the end of the gospel is not the end of the journey. We know from the things recounted in Acts that the disciples did go out to follow Jesus in the Holy Spirit even after he ascended. In many ways, the ends of the Gospels are the beginning of something. They're the beginning of the church. The beginning of the good news of Jesus' resurrection spreading. The journey those disciples went on after that meal, they needed a lot of sustenance to get through it. They needed strength for that journey. And I kind of think that's what Jesus is giving them. You know, Jesus says these words to Peter. You know, you used to go wherever you want, but someday someone's going to grab you and take you. And to me, that signifies Peter's going out to follow Jesus. But as John indicates, it is also that Peter, Peter ends up crucified upside down in Rome. That is where his journey following Jesus ends on this earth. It is not always an easy road to follow Jesus. But Peter made the journey from that moment on. And so... To speak of breakfast metaphorically, I wonder what it is that sustains you. What keeps you going in the faith? You know, we all have, hopefully, an experience where we came to know Jesus, where he entered our life, where we gave our life to him. Maybe we all need to have it again every once in a while to return to Jesus. But in between those, these peak mountain experiences of transcendence, of, of faith, of giving your life to God, there is a lot of just life lived in faith. It's not an easy journey. There are a couple particular things uh, to our tradition. There, we aren't the only people who believe them, but they are particular. One thing which the Methodist Church believes is something called the universal availability of salvation. Now, this does not mean that everyone will be saved, but what it means is that everyone has the chance to be saved. Everyone on earth could be saved. Everyone has the chance to give their life to Christ, right? Now, maybe that seems obvious to you, but from a, um, a Calvinist perspective, um, our Presbyterian brothers and sisters and many others, that is not the case. They believe in a limited atonement because they say God is all-powerful. God has to know who will make it. And if God knows who's, who, will, who will achieve salvation, who will uh, answer the call, then that also means God knows the people who will fall away. And so they say, if God is all-powerful, some people will never be saved, cannot be saved. What we say is God is so powerful that God gives us the chance, that God calls all of us. Everyone has the chance to answer. But along with that, what we also believe is that just because you have been saved, just because you say, I have faith in Jesus Christ and in the eternal life which he gives me, that does not mean you are saved forever. John Wesley was very concerned with something called backsliding, right? You achieve faith, you have this great experience, you say, I love the Lord and I'll never give, give God up. And then the days go by, the weeks pass, you get less excited, other things come up, and suddenly you wake up one day and say, I don't know if I believe anymore. That can happen. So I want you to think, what are the things that Christ gives us to sustain us for the journey, 
to keep us from falling away? What are the things that brought you to this video today that you somehow still believe enough to listen to whatever I've got to say? One thing you might say is prayer. If someone is, is never praying, is never trying to speak and have a daily relationship with the Lord, it is very easy to stop feeling like God is there. One of the gifts Christ gives us is the chance to pray, to continually offer ourselves to him. Along with that, one thing that gives us sort of strength for this journey is worship. Whether it is online right now or in person, and, and I think we all know there's something special about being in person if we feel safe doing it, that'll give you strength to, to unite with fellow believers to help build one another up. And we all know if you miss church for a few weeks, it feels really hard to get back on the wagon, right? It feels really hard to get back in that rhythm. And yet when you are in rhythm, when you are used to going to church every week, you miss the weeks you miss. Uh, it's funny, sometimes I will go on vacation and it will be Sunday and maybe I'll be somewhere where I don't know a church or it's I don't have a car with me and I, and I now I'll end up watching something online, of course. But before, at about this time, it's, it's 9.30 Sunday morning. I record these pretty close to worship at this point. This time of day, if I'm on vacation, I feel like I need to go to church. I just need that. My soul needs that to get through the rest of the week, right? So worship is another thing that, that uh, keeps us along the journey. Another thing that does sustain us, like the breakfast Jesus offers, are the sacraments. Our sharing in baptisms when they happen and reaffirming our baptism, but also the Lord's Supper. This, this physical, tangible reminder that Christ offers himself to us and that he offers it to the whole congregation. There was a period where we did not have communion for a good stretch during that pandemic, and, and Lord, I know I missed it. And a lot of you out there said you missed it too. There are other things that sustain us. Um, one thing, along with worship and the sacraments, is other what Wesley calls works of piety. Um, if you have a daily practice of devotion or prayer, if we have... Um, Scripture reading, right? Devotion to the scriptures. That will sustain you. And if you don't spend time in the Bible, it's very easy to start thinking of God as who you imagine God to be and not who God says he is in the scripture. There are other works of piety. Uh, things like fasting, things like praying, things like other spiritual disciplines. Another thing that is underrated that I think keeps us strong is works of, of mercy, is what Wesley calls them. When you go out and uh, visit someone, or you check in with a friend, or you uh, volunteer for, for a good cause at the food bank, or Meals on Wheels, or all the million things that some of y'all do, I know that that gives you strength to keep going. And for some of us, that also includes uh, speaking our mind when it comes to the way the world is going. We don't always agree on what it is, but being active in the uh, social world, that is advocating for things we believe in, if it's tied to the scripture, um, that will sustain you as well. If we don't attend to these things, if we don't uh, spend time resetting ourselves on the path of faith, it is an easy one to fall away from. There's one last thing that I, I was trying to put into words. 
the scene with Jesus and Peter, where Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, of course, Lord, I love you. He does it three times. And as someone else pointed out to me, Peter, of course, denies Jesus three times. To me, this is Jesus' sign, Peter, I forgive you for that. Giving sort of Peter the chance to redeem himself. One thing that I think will keep you on the path is forgiveness. Is to use the big fancy word they use now a lot, reconciliation. It is hard to follow Jesus if you hold on to anger. It is hard to follow Jesus if you hold a grudge. Because here he is forgiving the disciple who ran away and abandoned him and denied him. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If Christ has forgiven you, then to follow him, we need a lot of forgiveness, a lot of grace, a lot of mercy. To stay on the path of Christ, we need to know what he has done for us. But then we also have to live it. We have to try our very best, and plenty of us do not always succeed, to look like him, to forgive like him, to love like him. Sometimes it's hard. Peter does not have an easy road. And it is hard sometimes to be forgiving, to be graceful. In a busy world, and it can seem a lot harder if you're on the outside, just like not going to church. But if you attend to the hard, if you dive into the difficulty knowing that it is a place Jesus has promised, it is worth more than anything else this world can offer. The food for the journey is in the footsteps of Christ, is in following him, learning from him, and leaning on him when you feel like you're slipping away. So we all have room to grow, and all our room to grow is different. But I hope you will <clears throat> find a new way to attend to Christ today. Um, and maybe we all together can stay on the path. give us strength to walk in your way, to stay on the journey even when it is hard, and Lord, feed us with your Holy Spirit that we might meet you on the final day and see that we have walked a path of light. Lord, we pray for those who do not know you. May we present you to them in spirit and in truth. 
We pray all these things in your blessed name. Amen. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.